everybody, this is Soviet Bear, and uh, my guest is once again my regular guest Joaquin Flores. So, Joaquin, this the topic of today's video is uh, Serbia, Serbian elections, and uh, Vojislav Šešel, the leader of the Radical Party. So, please, uh, what can you say about the Serbia and these elections and the? Sheshel, you know, is now out and free. So, what's going on, and how is it going on? How is it going to affect the Ser Serbian and Croatian uh, bilateral relations? Because I hear Croatian people say, "Oh, if Russia, if you were behind the Sheshel's, you know, freedom, then Croatian people are going to hate you forever." So, what can you say? Oh, okay, okay. That's about seven questions, man. But uh, let me try to like just dissect what you're saying. So today is the elections uh, for parliament in Serbia, which will like also form the government. So they're going to get the prime minister, yeah. as well as like um, ministerial positions out of it will be appointed by the new government when it forms. Uh, so basically, if you're not in following Serbian politics for some time and you just kind of want to know the most general overview. Yeah, um, I haven't been, the, because I have been following Ukraine and Syria and all that stuff, and I'm sorry for my negligence of Serbia, some sort of... Oh, no, it's not It's not you. I think it's just, so, I mean, it's the country's got 7.5 million people, right? Yeah. And uh, they're having population problem, and um, they're having economic problems, and they're the last uh, country um, of, of you know of some import, I guess, besides Macedonia, that's not part of EU, yeah. and um, or isn't part even part of the the joining uh, group of EU countries. They're at the least lowest stage of of talks, and they haven't progressed in a long time. Uh, the majority of people don't really want to join the EU. It used to be like a slight majority, and it's gone way down. Um, but they're even more against NATO than they are to EU. So probably, you know, 40% of the population would say, or maybe 30% of the population would say, let's join EU. But only like 10 to 15% would say that we should join NATO. So that's the situation there. So, and so the elections kind of the elections, but it's not. Yeah. That's not the main. It's one of the framing issues, but obviously there's everyday things going on here: scandals, economic reforms, cuts to public stuff that haven't been popular. Um, you know, the the present government is is trying to balance a a mixed foreign policy. They're trying to be friendly with Russia, but they're trying to be friendly with uh, Europe and America too. And um, of course, they can't sit in two chairs forever. Absolutely. So that's Absolutely. sort of... Absolutely, yes. Because, you know, we see what's happened in Ukraine. They tried to sit on two chairs and... Yeah, people do compare, people do compare the present situation. It's similar to Ukraine, except that the all the nationalists, you know, in in Serbia um, are anti-EU and anti-NATO, and they tend to favor very strongly the uh, Russian Federation. Yes, uh, that is the, the key difference. But uh, what else is concerning me is that, um, you know, the nationalists in Ukraine, they are anti-Russian. That is the point of their existence. Because, you know, there are more similarities than differences of, between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, so, the whole base, the, the whole thing is the, the whole, you know, base, the whole foundation of the Ukrainian nationalism is the idea that we are not Russian. And Ukraine is not Russia, is their key, you know, motto. Yeah. So, so with, with Serbia, the well, they tend to be pro-Russian, um, though that seems to be working against the Serbian sovereignty and against the Russian alliance is by, um, you know, the sort of uh, uh, Arabi Suri slash Vladimir Suchan 
line of propaganda, yeah, yeah. which is that they're going to try to mobilize nationalists around the idea that the present government enough destabilize that government and then use that as a trick to put in an even more pro-Western government. The, the fact of the matter is, is that, is that uh, NATO's been growing, EU's been growing, the present government is under pressure, but they don't have a clear perspective. They're, they're a coalition. So in the last six years, there was a lot of changes in Serbia and in which is now the present government. I'm not going to bore people with details, but they drew, they were a fusion of the most radical anti-NATO nationalists with the uh, Comprador uh, sellout government. And they kind of came together to form a middle path party, uh, which is uh, trying to sit in two chairs. And there are some elites and leaders in the party who have more pro-Russian, others are more pro-sovereign Serbia and, and don't think that Serbia, that thinks that Serbia should remain neutral. And yet there's others who want to join the EU and NATO, or there's others who want to join the EU, but not NATO. But everyone who wants to join NATO wants to join the EU. There's almost nobody in the present government that wants to join NATO. I'd say it's, they almost don't exist. But the EU voice is strong, but it's unpopular with the masses, and the government can't maintain a mandate to govern if they take strident EU steps. Uh, recently, they did make more concessions to NATO, um, allowing um, many of the terms uh, of, that NATO wanted, which Milosevic had previously uh, declined, which resulted in uh, Serbia being bombed uh, for a few months, uh, so in, in uh, 16 years ago. Um, thousands of people were killed. It's a, it was a bloody NATO campaign that doesn't get talked about. Clinton was beating Madeleine Albright, you know, the one who said that half a million dead Iraqis was worth it. She was behind that. And, um, and the partition of Serbia uh, was part of that. And um, subsequently, Serbia lost Kosovo and Montenegro uh, as a result of Western influence. So that's sort of the, the situation there. Most people kind of know that stuff. So today's election, um, the government's been under pressure, but there's been attempts by different nationalist groups to make a stronger showing. Um, uh, Voyaslav Sheshel was released from The Hague uh, earlier in the year, and that was a big uh, deal earlier last year. Um, he's been out for over a year now. That was a big deal. And um, so this is the first election that Sheshel is a free man yeah. after being at The Hague for a dozen years uh, on, on, on charges that couldn't be proven. He was, he was exonerated. He, he was found not guilty. Um, yeah. So there's numerous conspiracy theories about yes, why yes. he was released. Is there because it's a kangaroo court? Is, hmm. there, is there a Russian involvement in his release? Uh, there's involvement, but the word involvement is very fucking vague. I mean, it, the, the, the he would not have been released if the Americans did not okay it. Yeah, because you know, I hear some people saying that it was Russia behind his release, and especially. Croats saying this, Croatian people. Okay, okay, yeah, this is a complicated story because it's not what it seems, okay? So, yeah, Sheshel is, uh, in terms of the conflict with NATO and, and Serbia's sovereignty, he's, a, he's the good guy in this. Um, uh, so he said controversial things in the past. Uh, I, you know, it, most, most humbly, I'm not a person who has the authority or the or the life experience or the connection with Serbia to cast a judgment about other things that he believes that I may not agree with personally. That's not the point of this discourse. Um, but he's solidly anti-NATO and anti-EU, and uh, he's unrepentant about uh, Serbia's role in, in the last uh, you know, uh, 20 years, 25 years uh, in its history. So um, basically, uh, yes, the Russians were involved in uh, getting together the medical team um, that said that he had cancer, which most probably he doesn't have, um, and that was used as a pretext. We'll remember that 
during uh, Milosevic trial, Russian doctors attempted to say that he was sick and therefore should be released. Uh, that was rejected and he died in jail. Um, uh, they also failed to convict him. He also waged his own defense. Both of these men are brilliant lawyers, attorneys, who actually beat the arguments of the Hague kangaroo court, but because it's a kangaroo court, political pressure is what counts. So that's kind of the important thing here. So even though Shesha was released and he beat the charges, and even though he did beat the charges in terms of the arguments, the legal arguments that were raised, the inability of the Hague to demonstrate his guilt, that's not why he was released. So basically what happened is that um, while he is in prison uh, at the Hague uh, awaiting uh, sentencing, uh, awaiting con uh, verdict rather, he um, was uh, uh, always attacking the present government, Vucic. Um, why? Because they're making concessions to the EU, they're making concessions to NATO, um, they're cozy, they're trying to cozy up to Russia and so again the present government has done mixed things. They had the very large uh, uh, military parade showing that uh, Serbia is not, a, not uh, subservient as an independent power. Uh, it was a somewhat impressive parade for a country that only has less. Uh, Putin was there, he received some, the highest award of the state, so it was a a pro-Putin sort of uh, display, um, Serbia's display. In 2011, under the present leadership, the uh, Serbia joined uh, the Russian CSTO as an observer, but observer status is supposed to be a step into joining, you know, uh, at, least co at least theoretically. Uh, and then, of course, they opened the Russian Emergency Response Center in uh, south of Serbia, Niche, which is Many intelligence analysts believe that this is the first step in building a military base. Of course, right now it's an intelligence hub uh, where uh, the uh, Russian Foreign Intelligence Service uh, openly operates on the territory of Serbia. Yeah, so that's right. So uh, it's a mixed bag here. I mean, things are things. Uh, some people ask, well, what's the significance of Belgrade? Why is Serbia so important? It's a tiny country, it, and I just tell people, you know. If you were like born in 1990 or you know whatever 2000, and you're living in this world that exists today, you may not understand the importance of Belgrade. But I just, for instance, go look at any James Bond movie yeah. ever made. It was almost always a major scene in Belgrade because it, historically it's the you know intelligence and spy capital of the world. It's the cross section between East and West. Uh, during the, they had cooperation with NATO, but also cooperation with Warsaw. Even though it was a communist state, they were not part of Warsaw Pact, and they had alliances with Western powers too. Uh, for those reasons, sometimes they were even called fascist. But these arguments aside, I'm just giving a picture of, of, of the history and the situation. Uh, in fact, historically, the, the James Bond character uh, by the British author was actually based upon a Serbian spy. Uh, and so it's, uh, and, and Belgrade, like I said, is the major um, intelligence hub in the world. Um, it's, a, it's a very beautiful city, it's a very romantic city, historical city. It's been part of the Ottoman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire. It was once called Sigadunum. It was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was part of its own Serbian Empire. And uh, it's, it's uh, just a, a major uh, historical city and, and it has a lot of relevance today. Um, it is said, you know, he who controls uh, Belgrade uh, can control the Balkans, and uh, if you don't control Belgrade, you don't have full control over the Balkans. Yeah. So uh, NATO does not have full control over the, over, Balkans. Over the Balkans, even though they have uh, control over the governments in Romania, Croatia, and so forth. They don't fully control Serbia, maybe 50% or 65% control right now in Serbia. So right now is a big fight. That's why this election is kind of interesting in, in relation to that. Of course, every electoral outcome reflects these dynamics. It reflects these contradictions that are inherent in the Serbian uh, situation. So uh, to then now, in that context, answer what was the big deal with Sheshel. So uh, probably it seems that he was released um, by the Americans, uh, also the Russians agreed to create the medical preconditions for his release. 
Um, but the Americans expected him to be released and begin to attack Vucic because um, what Sheshel does is he's actually very intelligent and calculating. He's made some errors, but he's very intelligent and calculating, but he acts much more crazy and irrational than he really is. Um, because he, as, a, as, a, as a populist, he, he taps into that public, uh, that public mass insanity, which all mass publics you know, uh, display in, in many forms. And, and he taps into that, uh, that, that, uh, that essence of, of the spirit of the people, uh, which is, of course, not rational. It's, it's, it's anti-rational. It's irrational. But it's also just. So there's a lot of contradictions. Again, um, so that's really the thing to understand is that while the, while the Russians played a role in his release, the Americans actually arranged him to be released, thought that he would attack Vucic, but the first thing he does when he gets released is not attack Vucic, but attacks the former government of the Democratic Party, uh, which was the puppet government installed by the Americans. Um, so that, so uh, there have been pro-American uh, fake nationalists operating in Serbia. Some of them are admitted one-time agents of American intelligence, but they pretend now to be good, solid pro-Russian nationalists like... Uh, George Bukadinovich, the chief editor of NSPM, which poses as a pro-Russian Serbian national, but has been calling for an alliance with the liberal Western Atlanticist party uh, under the belief that Vucic is the main evil and that everyone, everyone must put aside these differences between Eurasianist and Atlanticist just to remove Vucic. So it's really crazy also. So, so this attempt is also to uh, attempt to tap into some kind of public insanity I think that's not going to work, but uh, but certainly Sheshel was released as part of a pro-Western plot, but he foiled the plot. He did not attack them. Then, once it was clear he was not attacking the government, uh, the Hague then started calling for his return. Uh, Croatia, now I'm going to talk about Croatia, the Croatia part of your question. Croatia, so he burned a Croatian flag, so he so that made so that hurt some Croatian feelings, yeah. and you know he also reminded everyone that Croatia ethnically cleansed over a quarter million Serbs from the Serbian parts of uh, which should be Serbia but are part of the Croatian state today, yeah. and um, and and so Serbia got a raw deal there uh, in the 90s. And uh, he's also called, he's also said uh, that, uh, you know, Kosovo is Serbia and that the Republic of Srpska in Bosnia and Herzegovina is also Serbia. So his platform is called Greater Serbia. Now, um, Western paranoiacs and anti-Serb activists uh, mistranslate the Serbian and, and call it Greater Serbia uh, and try to make allusions to Hitler's Lebensraum or to uh, the irredentism of, uh, of Mussolini's Italy. But he's actually referring to something more like Great Britain. It's called Great Serbia. So basically, uh, all the places where there you have Orthodox Serbs who speak Serbian language should be part of Serbia. And these are not uh, uh, non-contiguous parts. These are con these are these are all the parts that border on Serbia, but they're not in Serbia's border. Strangely, uh, this is the result of the war from the 90s that everyone knows so very well. Uh, so Croatia says that uh, Russia did this. Actually, the Americans did it. But I want to say that actually, tactically, this is working out very well for Serbia because Croatia uh, is completely opposed to Serbia entering the EU uh, because they say this is incompatible with European values. And I agree with them. And I think that Croatia has played a very constructive role, actually, in helping keep Serbia out of the EU. So actually, Croatia and Serbians agree that Serbia has no place in the EU. It's somewhat similar to... Uh, Macedonia and Greeks blocking Macedonia based on their name and likewise Croatians are, are trying to, to, to block Serbia on the basis that Serbia still refuses to really fully repent for the alleged crimes of the war which was largely a defensive war on the part of Serbs and, uh, and, and that's just the historical record. Anyone who really wants to explore this can look at the American uh, historian and, and political analyst uh, Michael Parenti wrote very well about this. He's not a Milosevic apologist. He's critical of Milosevic. He's critical of some of the nationalist trends and the way that tensions were heightened through nationalist rhetoric. But that's going to happen on both sides of the equation. The Bosniaks, the Croats, the Albanians, and the Serbs all had nationalist parties. And there's some good arguments, in fact, that, that American intelligence was involved in making sure that on all sides, including the Serbian, 
that the nationalists got into power. Why? Because only the Yugoslav ideal was the one that was about holding them all together, whereas all the nationalist movements were like micro-nationalist movements, uh, anti-Yugoslavian, and of course would have led to the dissolution of Yugoslavia, which fit in perfectly to the NATO plot. So, and I hate to say that because I do support uh, today, the, the aims of, of, the Ser of some of the Serbian national ideals, for example, the reuniting of Serbian lands, staying out of NATO, uh, uh, more, more concretely staying, uh, getting out of the IMF, they're tangled up horribly right now with the IMF, getting out of the IMF, staying out of the EU, not entering NATO, all of these are very good things that uh, the mainstream of Serbian nationalists are standing for. So. Um, that, that's the long and short of it. So Croatia is actually playing a constructive role here uh, in, in their complaints. Um, they're wrong that Russia was behind it. It seems like Russia was behind it. Uh, I think that is confusing um, uh, because it, cause then why was Shesha working for the Americans or, or what? No, Shesha knew what he was going to do when he got out. So he played a game. Uh, he played it very well. He outsmarted them. Then what happened, of course, is that once he was out, well, the present government, they receive requests from The Hague to, to send him back, and the present government has, has to deny it. Why? Because Sheshel's so popular. Now, what I mean is everyone really believes here that it was wrong that he was sent to The Hague. They may not be voting for the radical party, and they may think that he says things that sound crazy, and many of them may feel they want to, sound, they want to be more moderate or more accepted in the global community um, while not joining NATO or the EU, but they don't want to seem like warmongers, so to speak, or war criminals, so they uh, distance themselves from the perceptions of Sheshel, yet at the same time they all pretty much understand and agree that it was wrong he was in The Hague. So there was no way the present government could then send him back, because then the present government would really be setting itself up to lose big time, uh, and to really lose any credibility that they may have built by making overtures to Russia, which were somewhat successful so far. So that's really the best way to paint the picture. Uh, uh, and framing the setups of today's election right now. Yeah, good. I think you have uh, <clears throat> you have explain, explained it a lot and explained it well. So now I want now I, I would like to ask you uh, to give uh, your perspective on who is who is possibly you know who who would possibly win this this election and. Um, and uh, how it is all going to end, and who, who will end up the majority of the parliament. Okay, so I'm going to keep it simple, because there's 20 different parties running, but I'm just going to focus on, you know, four or five, and I won't, I won't get into the names of the people or anything that's yeah. going to, you know, lose the point or, or lose, the, lose the plot here. Um, so the government that's in power now is probably going to stay in power, but they're going to they're gonna keep the majority... They may or may not be able to form a government without a coalition. Um, experts are divided on that. Uh, but their tendency is to form a coalition even if they don't need to so that they can pass the buck about issues relating to inefficiency in the event that those charges or, you know, those, those accusations always come out of the press uh, from both sides, from the liberal and the nationalist side. This government gets criticized a lot from both sides. So it's good for them to have a coalition partner even if they don't need one just so that they can say, well, it was this other guy's fault. So that's the game they play with. Um, and so the, so the present government had been made uh, with the Socialist Party, even though uh, we can say in American terms that, they, that the, 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 the Progressive Party, the present ruling uh, party, had a, had a supermajority and didn't need them to make a government, um, but they brought them in anyway uh, for, for pragmatic... Uh, Machiavellian, I should say, purposes, and they did that well. So uh, probably the the present government, the Progressive Party, will be able to uh, maintain uh, control, and but they will lose some percentages. Um, who will gain are uh, are three nationalist parties. Uh, one of them is the radicals. The other two are running together as a single block, although they have some great divisions. That's DSS and Devedi. Devedi means like door or gates, yeah. but it's kind of a medieval uh, antiquated reference that you're supposed to think of a castle, I guess. And then uh, and the other is DSS, which is the 
Democratic Party of Serbia, not to be confused with the Democratic Party, the Serbian Democratic Party, not to be confused with the Democratic Party. Uh, the Democratic Party coalition is also running. They may pass the 5% census required to be seated in the parliament. The size of the parliament has recently been shrunk, so that's now, I think, about 250 people, uh, which means that you get more seats, of course, for each, uh, each seat is more valuable. Um, and uh, it looks like for the first time in a number of years, at least for the first time in this decade, uh, national, uh, nationalist parties will, uh, 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 at least the radical party will pass census because the Vedi and DSS uh, are running together, they should pass census also. Um, the biggest turnaround, the biggest difference and the positive is for the radicals because Shesha was out of, out of The Hague and uh, people have more confidence now people who might have been voting, people uh, kind of got soured over some of the radical party leadership in the absence of Sheshel, uh, or felt that the party didn't really have a purpose without Sheshel, and people were voting for much smaller lists, those, those parties that get less than 1%. Uh, radical youth had some splits some years ago, uh, which became Zabat uh other parties formed, and so forth. But it, I think for the first time in a, in, in a long time, um, now we'll see, in fact, uh, many of the people who had previously voted for the smaller parties will actually vote for radicals. So the biggest loser uh, will be, uh, numerically, will be the ruling party, although they'll continue to rule. And the biggest loser on the smaller parties will be the very, very small parties. Um, most of those votes will actually get reabsorbed by the more established nationalist parties uh, Devedi, DSS, and radicals. Uh, so, however, there's there's uh, some people who, who believe, and uh, and and I happen to be one of them, that among these nationalists, uh, some of these uh, potential MPs are in fact um, part of, uh, whether wittingly or unwittingly, part of a Western plot, and. Uh, certain people of NSPM, uh, Georgia Bukadinovich, who's not a minor uh, person in terms of uh, uh, being a pundit. He's, he's on TV all the time. He's, if he's not on TV for two days, he complains that there's censorship in, me, in mm -hmm. <laughs> Serbian media. He's, he's, a, he's a big fat asshole. He's a fucking useless human being. Uh, you know, I hope, I don't know, I, you know, I, if people say Serbs are violent, warlike people, I don't know why this man hasn't been off the record. I, I, I am a nonviolent man myself. I wouldn't dream of doing such a thing, but uh, I can certainly assure you that I'm surprised that he's still alive. Uh, the man is just uh, completely repulsive in every way and uh, repugnant, but yet somehow he's got some people under a spell. Uh, he's admitted to being a CIA agent in the past. He supported uh, the October 5th movement. He supported Otpor. Uh, he's been a Gene Sharp uh, operative for a long time in Serbia. Uh, because Serbia is so pro-Russian and so pro-nationalist, uh, everyone pretends to be pro-Russian. So even the George Soros people pretend to be pro-Russian. That's a scam. That's the big trick right now. So among the, these nationalist uh, lists are some traitors who are fake, and they actually want to uh, help change ministerial positions. I don't think, I think that people are pretty accurately projecting the outcome of this election. So actually the question is after the election, when the government, when there, there's, when the winning parties attempt to form a government, uh, I'm questioning whether there's going to be a street movement, tent city, that type of thing, um, which attempts to undo the actual results of the election through a protest movement, uh, not to unseat the government per se, but actually a soft version where simply a European a uh, liaison uh, is brought in, or an anti-corruption prosecutor is brought in by the EU uh, to go after the pro-Russian wing of uh, the Vucic uh, government. There's also a pro-American wing as well, and they don't get attacked in the media. So that's what's so strange about it. So the government gets attacked for, for taking pro-Russian and pro-EU positions, but when it comes to naming names in the media, it tends to be the pro-Russian people who get attacked the most. So that should tell you really what's going on. There's been a definite change in tone in Western media in recent months um, that, that is trying to call Vucic uh, a, a, an autocrat or an authoritarian. And, uh, and 
this is clearly part of the script of how they set up these color spring type tactics. So these are the things that we're looking at. It's a very confusing thing. Uh, Serbian politics is, is very confusing uh, for outsiders to understand. It's, it's an enigma wrapped in a mystery, you know, inside of a riddle, as they say. And I think that the best way to understand this is that here in Serbia, there's already been a color spring coup. In fact, it was, it was one of the first in, in recent history. And, and because of that, uh, Serbs are somewhat inoculated to the standard old practice. That's why the new uh, 2.0 color spring tactic uh, has been hybridized and it's uh, been recombinated, uh, sort of like a virus that's recombinated uh, as a retrovirus and is now uh, trying to follow a fake pro-Russian meme. So it's quite, it's quite intricate. Yeah. Okay. Do you mind if we change subject a little bit? No? For sure. Let's do it. Okay. So.